Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for participating of this webinar. We will be starting in about five minutes. So thank you for waiting.
Well, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Thank you all of you for connecting and participating of uh, this webinar uh, about future proofing the network with the right IPv6 address plan. We are very happy to count with the participation of Tom Coffin. And um, well, you know this um, uh, Tom is a is a is a, a very uh, distinguished person in this uh, area. He actually wrote a book about IPv6 address planning as well as an IPv6 evangelist and a distinguished architect and infoblogs. The Infoblox is the market leader in DNS, the HCP and IP address management and network autom automatization solutions. At Infoblox, Tom is focused on the articulation of effective IPv6 adoption strategies as well as IPv6 adoption trends for customers, potential customers and the public media. So Tom brings uh, 20 years of network engineering and ar architecture experience to share with us. Uh, he also has participated at LACNIC events, so we are very happy to count with his, his participation here. Well, in this webinar, uh, we will, you can see we have a, a, a chat there in the, in, in the window. You can use the chat online to ask any questions. So uh, it, 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 we ask you to use the option to ask the opponents and the assistants so all the people can see all the questions and we don't have to repeat them. And sometimes maybe from another question, we can, um, uh, we can um, make one question for us. So, uh, please uh, put that option so everybody can see the questions and all the questions will be answered at the end of Tom's presentation. We will read them out loud. Out loud. We hope to have time to answer them all. If not, please uh, you can send your questions to an email address. We will put that email address at the end. It's actually uh, communicaciones at lagging.net, but we will put it in the end of the presentation. We also like to remind you that we will, we are recording this webinar, so we will then uh, publish this uh, record on our web, on our website. We will also put the link uh, at the end of the presentation, so you can access uh, then to this. Uh, record and also to Tom's presentation. Also, we would like to invite you to, we, we are constantly looking for uh, interesting topics to do this kind of webinars. So if you have any topic to suggest to us, so please do it, send it to also the email that will appear at the end of the presentation. And we will be very happy to, to receive your suggestions and try to make more webinars interesting for you. So I don't have any other thing to say, so I will give the, the word to, to Tom. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for participating and all of you for, for participating too. And remember to make all your questions in the chat. Uh, you can write them now and we will read them in the end. So, Go ahead, Tom. Thank you very much, Giannina, uh, for that generous introduction. And I'm very happy to be here uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, where you're tuning in from, to talk about my favorite technology topic of IPv6 in general and IPv6 address planning in particular. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my screen shared here so you can see the presentation. So hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, I've thrown a few of my favorite IPv6 memes onto this uh, opening slide here for your enjoyment. Uh, some of them are, are quite humorous, uh, but there's a, there's a kernel of truth underlying a number of them uh, related to IPv6 
and the fact that we're moving into a new era of the internet based on having an abundant resource for addressing that that has really been a constraint on growth in the past, uh, well, at least within the last five years. And now that we've officially gotten down to the dregs of IPv4 uh, pretty much worldwide, it's, uh, it's really time to, uh, to, to move forward with the new IP protocol that will give us sufficient addressing to continue to scale and grow the internet. And that's the whole purpose of really why we need to think about or the whole reason rather why we need to think about IPv6 address planning in the first place. And so <clears throat> my goal for the presentation is to go through some of the, the most important principles related to IPv6 address planning. Um, but before I do that, I want to sort of set up the reason why uh, IPv6 address planning is its own topic, because you might be thinking if, you know, if you're, uh, if you have a background in networking and network architecture and engineering, and you haven't really looked too closely at IPv6, you might be excused for thinking that it's just the same uh, with as with IPv4, that you're going to be applying the same principles with uh, allocating addresses and with um, doing large scale network architectures or whatever scale network architectures you happen to be doing, that you'll be using the same, the same process and practice that you used with IPv4. And as we'll see through the course of the presentation, um, that, that typically doesn't work because of the, uh, the amount of IPv6 space that's available. Uh, so if, if we have time, I have a little bit of a, an example or case study at the end of the present or towards the end of the presentation um, that will sort of show a high level uh, enterprise IPv6 address plan based on um, some customers that I've worked with that, that uh, are running very large enterprises and that have started moving forward with IPv6. So the first concept, the first sort of bedrock principle or most important idea around IPv6 and IPv6 address planning in particular is that there's no equivalent to IPv4 address conservation in IPv6. And, and this, is, this is a sort of first principle that that before you start working with IPv6, you, you really have to become comfortable with the fact that all of the ways in which you've really focused on trying to preserve or conserve IPv4 addresses in the past, uh, that's not going to be necessary to do anymore with, uh, with IPv4, or with IPv6 rather. And not only is it not necessary, uh, it's actually quite um, potentially restricting and uh, harmful to your IPv6 address plan. And so, uh, you know, hopefully the folks on, on that are attending the webinar today have, have worked with IPv6 enough to sort of understand that, that it's really an apples and oranges comparison in terms of the size of space between IPv4 and IPv6. But I like to start off with, uh, with an IPv4 to IPv6 comparison analogy and, and these are quite common if you've if you've sat through any IPv6 presentations it's it's really kind of a typical thing to see a, a present a presentation compare IPv4 to IPv6 in terms of the overall address space size. And the one that I happen to like to use has to do with uh, basically comparing IPv4 and IPv6 in the context of of astronomy, which I'm a big fan of. So this, the title of this slide, the limits of the, ad, the adjective astronomical. So sometimes if you hear somebody mentioning IPv6 in casual conversation or uh, they'll be talking about uh, the, the size of the IPv6 address space being, being astronomically large. And so this comparison shows that, that that's not even really an accurate adjective to use when we're describing the IPv6 address space. So, if we start off with a, a, a basic estimate of the number of stars in our particular galaxy, so if you, if you imagine the universe and it's filled with a number of galaxies and each of those galaxies has a number of stars, um, our galaxy in particular, the Milky Way, is, is considered medium, small, medium size uh, among the galaxies that are out there, but it's estimated that there's, some, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. So that's quite a large number. And if you think about that in the context of IPv4, 
we have a total of 4.3 billion addresses. So that's two orders of magnitude larger than the IPv4 address space. So then if we look at the number of the total number of galaxies in the universe, and again, no one's actually counted this, but it's, uh, it's an estimate that astronomers use to sort of make some assumptions about um, the size of the universe and, and, and what, uh, what it's occupied with. Uh, that estimate is somewhere around uh, 2 trillion. So if we do a little bit of multiplication here, and I'm gonna use scientific notation to keep everything nice and tidy, but I've got 4.0 times 10 to the 11th, which is a very large number. That's the 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. And I'm gonna multiply that by uh, 2.0 times 10 to the 12th, which is 2 trillion, which is the number of galaxies in the universe. I get this very large number, 8.0 times 10 to the 23rd. So, you know, eight and then 23 zeros essentially. Um, so a very large number. Now I'm going to take this very large number, which is the total, if, if you think about this, the multiplication of number of stars in the Milky Way, number of galaxies in the universe, this should be an estimate of the total number of stars in the universe. So it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 8.0 times 10 to the 23rd. Well, I'm going to divide that by the total amount of IPv6 address space, which is 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. Um, we don't generally expand this des with a decimal expansion, we don't generally think of it in terms of the, the very large number that it is if we, if we expand it uh, in a decimal fashion. We do that with IPv4, it's 4.3 billion. It's a very manageable number, even, even though it's very large. Uh, with 3.4 times 10 to the 38th, uh, that's a very, very large number. But obviously, you can see here that, that, there, that it's disproportionately larger than the number, the total number of stars in the universe by a factor of 4.3 times 10 to the 14th. So what that's telling us is that IPv6, uh, the, the total number of IPv6 host addresses offers approximately 430 trillion times more addresses than the estimated number of stars in the universe. So it, it's just the, the point here, uh, as with all analogies comparing IPv4 to IPv6 address space size, is that we're dealing with what is essentially an inexhaustible quantity of IPv6 addressing. And I, I know I get, I, you know, you'll, you'll get into, you can potentially get into arguments with folks about whether or not any resource is inexhaustible and, and, and humans have a kind of a poor track record for dealing with resources that are, are scarce or constrained. And so with IPv4, it's, a, it's, an, it's an example of where we started off with a, a number you know, back in the 70s that we thought would be pretty sufficient, but nobody could predict that the internet would grow to the size that it is today. And so as a result, there's a lot of paranoia and fear around the consumption of a resource that we've used in the past that we assume that uh, you know, is, is constrained as we go forward with IPv6. But as we'll see through the course of the presentation, it's precisely this type of thinking that will cause you problems when it comes time to do an IPv6 address plan and when it comes time to start working with IPv6 and deploying it on your network. So I'm gonna start off with an enterprise example here. And I know, um, you know, obviously we've got, we've got enterprises, we've got service providers. Uh, if you're coming from a service provider background, uh, the example doesn't necessarily apply. And chances are, if you're with a service provider, you've already been sort of thinking about how to get IPv6 on the network and, uh, and how to, uh, to allocate it efficiently. But um, this example, the example that I give here, ties into the larger challenge of just uh, being able to, uh, to deploy IPv6 and, and think about it in a rational way. So the, the early enterprise adopter, and this is, a, this is a common theme, I've run into it with many of our customers here at Infoblox. Um, the early enterprise adopter shows up, you know, this is sometime in the neighborhood of 2008, 2009. And the early enterprise adopter is, is going to go ahead and get it, an IPv6 allocation before anyone else does. Uh, but what happens is the network architect responsible for, for doing this, they, uh, they, they're doing the right thing by starting early with IPv6. And we've been encouraging that for many years to get started with IPv6. But what happens is they don't have enough information to be able to gauge the size of allocation that they need. And we'll see why that is the case in, in some slides coming up. So here's the early enterprise adopter that's getting a, a slash 48. And this is pretty much the smallest allocation that you can get from uh, a regional internet registry or an ISP if you're uh, actually requesting an allocation 
uh, to deploy in your own network, um, then a slash 48 is, is kind of the smallest prefix that you're likely to, to get. And, and the reason why slash 48 actually has other significance is because it's the smallest routable prefix on the internet. So if we look at in IPv4, we've got a slash 24, which is the smallest routable prefix. The equivalent of that in IPv6 is the slash 48. Well, if I'm an enterprise adopter of IPv6 and I've started off without any information about how to do, say, an IPv6 address plan, uh, and I've, I've gotten my, I've, I've gone out and done the right thing, and I've gotten an IPv6 allocation, and it's a slash 48, and I tell myself, well, you know, that's a huge amount of address space, right? That's 281 trillion internet. So 281 times 4.3 billion will add up to the, the slash 48, the number of host addresses that are available in a slash 48. So that would seem to be, and it, and it is actually, of course, sufficient for the purposes of addressing any network on the planet including the internet. You could take a slash 48 and use it to address any network on the, on, on, on the planet, including the, the internet itself, and you would not run out of host addresses. But the reason why that's uh, a, 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 a condition that's necessary having been met, but not sufficient in this case, has to do with the way in which we're going to carve up the IPv6 address space in order to make our address plan operationally flexible and extensible in our network. So, I mean, I can, I can easily argue that a slash 48 is more than enough address space for any enterprise, but you could, you could easily address any enterprise with a slash 64. That is 4.3 billion internets in and of itself. So 1.8 times 10 to the 19th host addresses, more than enough addresses for any network, but a slash 80 would work as well. That's uh, 65,000 uh, slash 32s in IPv4 land, or I'm sorry, the entire 32-bit IPv4 address space, even a slash 96 would work, right? I could, I could basically give myself with a slash 96 uh, an entire internet just for my enterprise. But of course, we're not supposed to subnet to the right of the slash 64. The protocol design for IPv6 takes 64 bits and reserves it for the interface identifier. So even though we could do this, we're not we're not really allowed to subnet. And and you'll see examples out in the out in the field where people have deployed IPv6, and they may do some subnetting um, outside of the slash 64 to the right of the slash 64, some smaller subnets. But in general, that's not recommended. So with IPv6, and here's a here's a humorous quote about Unix: the idea that you know you you give yourself enough uh, resources. You give yourself uh, enough flexibility and resources with a particular technology, and I inevitably what happens is that the, the people that are deploying that technology figure out a way uh, to make things hard on themselves by having uh, too much freedom, by having uh, too, much, too, much, uh, um, too much abundance of addresses in the case of IPv6 or in the case of Unix, the ability you know, to basically have a, a, a programmatic operating system that you can uh, tweak uh, to do anything you need it to do, um, you're going to get into trouble if you don't have some principles to follow. So if if you're used to making do with uh, IPv4 address space, for instance, you know you'll you'll typically have uh, at least one private network. You know, in the case of the largest available private network that you might use, a 10 a 10 slash 8 network. If you if you said that that was equivalent to one meter of rope, and here's another IPv4 uh, to IPv6 analogy. A slash 48 gives you enough rope to get to the moon and back 500 million times. So again, slash 48 should be plenty of address space for any network uh, now or in the future. But again, um, starting from that starting from that premise really misses the point and the opportunity that we have um, to use IPv6 to make our networks easier to manage and to make sure that we have sufficient uh, address resources going forward. So the whole principle behind IPv4 address planning is around, and I, I said that in particular, or specifically and purposely, IPv4 address planning. So the, the, what we're used to doing with IPv4 is, we're used to thinking uh, we, we can't waste IPv4 host addresses. And that, that IPv4 thinking is the biggest, the single biggest risk to, to having an effective IPv6 address plan. So IPv4 thinking is all about not wasting host addresses. And in, re, in IPv6, the reality is that there's no host address conservation required. 
So we're not thinking about conserving individual host addresses. And the reason for this should be obvious. If you think about what I mentioned before, that a slash 64, that's the, uh, the, the, the smallest um, legal prefix according to the protocol design because we're reserving 64 bits for the interface ID. So a slash 64 is what's gonna go on uh, a LAN interface or a VLAN interface or really any network interface that we're addressing. Uh, if you think about that fact, a slash 64 has 1.8 times 10 to the 19th addresses, host addresses in it. So from that standpoint, as we'll see here in a moment, it doesn't really matter how many addresses out of that slash 64 I use or don't use because of the fact that there's just so many addresses available in a single slash 64. So along with that, the idea with IPv4 that we're going to, we're going to allocate subnets based on um, using variable length subnet masking and CIDR notation where we're going to peel off individual bits in our subnet mask and IPv4 in order to create a subnet that, that uses the right amount of IPv4 host addresses so that we don't waste any IPv4 host addresses. But in IPv6, we'll see that it's much more efficient and we get um, much more operational value out of subnetting on the nibble boundary, uh, which is four bits. So we only subnet, or we can certainly subnet on the bit boundary, but in the case of subnetting on the nibble boundary, uh, we, get, uh, we get the ability to actually have an IPv6 prefix um, always uh, be unambiguous in terms of uh, the characters in the IPv6 prefix will, will stay uh, very tidy based on using this nibble boundary. And we'll see an example of this later in the presentation, so don't worry if, uh, if, if I'm not explaining it clearly yet. And then finally, the IPv4 thinking says, hey, if I get an allocation, especially if it's publicly routable IPv4 address space, I have to make do with that. Even if it's a private network, um, you know, if I don't wanna get into having a network with a lot of overlapping private address space, and we see this a lot with enterprises that have grown and they have a lot of, uh, they do a lot of mergers and acquisitions and they'll bring on a, a, another, they'll buy another enterprise and they'll onboard that into their network and then they'll have basically two networks that have the same private address ranges that they're trying to use. And so communication has to be mediated through network address translation uh, and those types of overlays or, or some other type of overlay that gets very complex and very brittle and causes end-to-end -end communication to be very difficult and challenging. Well, with IPv6, the idea is you get a large enough allocation to support what your network uh, looks like and to support what your network is likely to grow into. And what that means is, as we'll see later in the presentation, instead of constantly whittling your subnets down to a size where you're not, not wasting host addresses, you go in the other direction where you think of IPv6 address consumption in terms of prefixes. And if you need more prefixes for your network architecture or your network design, you just get a larger allocation. So let's look at a closer example of why IPv4 thinking um, really doesn't work with IPv6. And so we'll, we'll use the classic example of the requirement of putting IPv4 addresses on, on an interface. And we've all been through this exercise many, many times um, working with IPv4. And the whole, the whole idea with IPv4, we talk, about, uh, we talk about efficiency with IPv4, and we talk about efficient address consumption with IPv4. And what we're really talking about when we talk about efficiency is, is the conservation of host addresses. So if I think about having a, a LAN interface here, um, or really any, any interface, but in this case, I, I wanna, I, I'm thinking about a sort of broadcast medium where I have many hosts that are on the other end of a single interface. And it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it, it's ideal in IPv4 if I can stick a, a slash 24 on, on a LAN interface, say, um, maybe, and maybe a, maybe a larger subnet, a slash 23 or slash 22, depending on the number of servers, and of course, or number of hosts, rather, in the case of a data center environment where I might have a lot of, uh, uh, virtual machines spinning up and down. Maybe I need a larger subnet than a slash 24, but we'll start with the slash 24 um, and we'll say 254 host addresses. And, and generally I try to think, well, once I get to around 75% consumption, so 192 host addresses on that, 
that segment, then I start trying to, then, then I start having to think about, well, maybe I need a larger subnet for this particular interface. So assume, but assuming I can use 24s, you know, consistently, that that's pretty operationally valuable because I'm using the same size subnet wherever, you know, wherever I place a subnet on an interface, I, I try to use that same slash 24. Um, and then that provides like a tidy boundary for ACLs and routing summarization. And there may be a little bit of room for growth on the segment, depending on how many uh, hosts I have. Uh, but, but as we know, that's not how things work in the real world, right? So in one case, I might have eight hosts on a segment. Well, I'm not going to take an entire slash 24 in IPv4 and put, um, put that on a segment that only has on a VLAN interface or a LAN interface that only has eight hosts. Uh, that's, pretty wasteful, right, in the, in the sense of uh, IPv4 address conservation. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use variable length subnet masking, and I'm going to put a slash 28 on that interface. I'm using the CIDR notation instead of the subnet mask, but that's going to give me 14 host addresses. And if I've only got eight hosts on that segment, then I'm around 57% utilization. So there's a little bit of room for growth, um, but that, this way I'm not wasting IPv4 addresses. In the case of 30 hosts, I go through the same exercise. Um, I, can, I can go a couple different ways here, right? I can do a slash 27. Uh, that gives me 30 hosts, but I'm at 100% utilization. So if I want to add another host to that segment, well, I'm out of luck. I either have to add a secondary IP subnet or I have to readdress that interface with a larger subnet. I can go the other option, which is a slash 26. That gives me 62 host addresses, but now I'm only at 48% utilization, which means that uh, I'm wasting IPv4 host addresses, which in this environment are very valuable. And so we go through the same exercise with 119 hosts, and we got a couple of different options there, but the, the logic is the same. So in IPv6, as you might have figured out already, or might know already, everything gets a slash 64. An interface gets a slash 64. If I have eight hosts on that subnet, it gets a slash 64. If I have 30 hosts on that subnet, it gets a slash 64. If I have any number of hosts less than 1.8 times 10 to the 19th um, as, a, as a numerical value, it gets a slash 64. And if you think about this, does it really matter whether I, whether I have eight hosts or a thousand hosts or 10,000 hosts? Um, it, uh, if I take whatever that number is, because at some point I run out of the ability, I run out of memory to be able to, to do mapping from layer two to layer three on that interface. So as I go from uh, ARP or neighbor discovery to, to the IP address, uh, you know, how many entries can I have in a switch or a router? Maybe I can have 10,000, maybe I can have, let's say for the sake of argument, I could have a million. Well, if I divide a million by 1.8 times 10 to the 19th, or I divide two by 1.8 times 10 to the 19th, it, either way, it's an infinite, infinitesimally small number. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny number. So it really doesn't matter. So when I look at IPv6 interface assignment, LAN, VLAN interfaces, they get a slash 64. Point to point links, well, we've gone back and forth on this because there used to be a security risk with running a slash 64 on a point to point link because of neighbor discovery cache uh, exhaustion attacks. That's generally been fixed. In newer gear, that's not a problem anymore. Um, so point-to-point -point links get a slash 64. And this is very nerve wracking for a lot of network architects that have been working with IPv4 their entire careers because they're putting an entire slash 64 on, on a point-to-point -point link and they're only using two addresses. But again, does it matter whether I divide two by 1.8 times 10 to the 19th or 10 million? No, it doesn't. Um, so we're just a, we're just starting from the premise that a slash 64 uh, is the, is the prefix that we're going to use on an interface. The the exception to that, of course, is the loopback interface, which is is, uh, is still a slash a 128, still you know, the equivalent of a slash 32 in IPv4, um, and we'll generally pull all of our slash 128s out of a single slash 64 uh, to use for say router IDs. Um, but that's more of a management hack than it is. Um, really something that instructs us about how IPv6 address planning works. So IPv4 address planning, as we've talked about, there are never enough addresses, prefixes and network bits with IPv4. You just don't have enough addresses. You just don't have enough subnetting size to be able to efficiently address the network. 
So this makes a consistent address plan a lot more difficult to accomplish. I said it would be really nice if we could put a slash 24 on everything or a slash 22 for that matter uh, in data center environments. But we really can't do that with IPv4 because we're constantly worried about running out of host addresses uh, in a particular subnet. And if we try to use larger subnets, then we just are out, we just burn through our allocation very quickly. Even if we have a slash 16 or a slash 12 or even a slash 8, um, we've, if you've done network address planning for a long time, you can probably remember that, um, you know, you, at, at some point in the past, you thought, well, I'll take that 10 slash 8 and I'll, I'll reserve the second octet for, uh, say, a location in the network, and I'll reserve the third octet for a function. But what happens is with only 8 bits, uh, you only you run out of values to use very quickly. Well, this doesn't happen in IPv6 because of the size of the address and the, the overall size of the address space. So IPv4 doesn't really permit you to map hierarchy and network structure into your address plan while also giving you enough host addressing to use. And IPv6 does. So you get unlimited host addresses and you get sufficient bits to accommodate being able to represent your network structure. So the dream of being able to have a consistently sized prefix to use for a particular location in the network or a particular function and use that everywhere, that's something that you're able to do with IPv6. So this is, a, this is a pretty significant warning. If you're just starting with IPv6 and you think, well, I want to figure out how to, how to keep everything operationally consistent, so I'm going to take what I'm doing in IPv4 and I'm going to try to map that into IPv6, uh, I generally recommend don't do this because what ends up happening is you're taking all of the constraints that your IPv4 address plan is operating under and you're just importing them into IPv6. And you don't want to do this because you'll lose the operational flexibility that having the huge address space of IPv6 gives you. So an enterprise, and this is true for service providers as well, but enterprises, um, they need to start off with an IPv6 address plan. You've got a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here because you, you can't really determine the size of allocation you need until you do at least a little bit of address planning. Um, but you can't really do an address plan unless you sort of start off with an assumption about how large of an allocation that you need. So that's why address planning is in, IPv6 address planning is critically important um, to start with to start with the principles so that you have some uh, some some good solid foundation to uh, to know what size allocation to request. And that way, as you go forward, your address plan will have both scalability and flexibility. As the network gets bigger, um, you'll still be able to maintain the operational flexibility that you get with IPv6 uh, if you start off with a large enough allocation. So yeah, and if you if you have to do an address plan, by the time you get done doing an address plan, you end up with uh, some baseline IPv6 knowledge that should translate into other domains uh, related to IPv6, uh, but not specific to IPv6 address planning. So now we get to the basic principles or guidelines of IPv6 address planning. And the first one, which you probably already figured out is, you need to start off with a sufficiently large IPv6 allocation. So again, this goes back to that idea that instead of constantly subnetting and carving up my, my allocation into smaller and smaller subnets to make it work with my whatever my network looks like, in this case, I want my allocation to be large enough to accommodate whatever, however I want to organize my network operationally. So, you know, again, we get back to that, that, that dream that we've had of being able to take a, a single subnet that we know will give us enough addresses forever, and we're, we're able to assign that to a location. And, and if it, you know, in this case, it doesn't matter if I have a small location or a large location, because I've got a sufficiently large allocation, each one of those locations is going to get a subnet of the same size. So the three most important subnet sizes when you're doing your address planning, the, or, the overall organizational allocation. So this is the, the just the, the large IPv6 allocation that you're going to get from the regional internet registry or, or your ISP, uh, but in most cases, the regional internet registry. And in the case of Latin America, obviously that's LACNIC, uh, or if you're in Brazil or Mexico, getting it from the, uh, the country um, uh, internet registry. The next largest allocation would be site assignment, and that's the uh, the allocation that you're going to be assigning to sites within your network. And as we'll see, a site is a, a logical construct, so um, we're not too worried about 
qualifying the size of the site or making sure that all the sites are the same size as far as what's actually deployed there on the network. We're really just starting with this thought that, hey, from an operational standpoint, I want to be able to think of this location, I want to be able to think of this collection of networks as a site. And it's a logical construct. So as we'll see, uh, lots of different things can be considered a site in IPv6. And then finally, the interface subnet size. So that's, that's a slash 64. We just start from that, that rule of thumb because again, the interface ID, 64 bits have been set aside for the interface ID. Uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna subnet uh, smaller than a slash 64. So the other thing that we have to consider is whether or not we're going to use a provider independent allocation or a provider assigned allocation. Provider assigned is assigned by an ISP. And this is best for single home networks. So if I, if I only have one connection to the internet and I have a relatively small network and I know that it's not going to grow, then generally um, a slash 48 from a provider assigned slash 48 from my ISP is perfectly fine. So in the case, the, in the case of the ISP, they might have a 36. Generally, ISPs will have a 32 or larger, uh, a slash 32 or larger for their IPv6 allocation. But out of that, they're going to go ahead and assign, say, a slash 40 uh, to an enterprise provider assigned. But this is a non-portable assignment. So in the case where, uh, let's say I find a cheaper internet service provider that I wanna use, uh, I'm gonna have to go ahead and number out of that network that I got from the ISP and give them their IPv6 allocation back. So this is an instance where if I have a singly homed IP network, um, a single homed enterprise network or any network that I'm getting an allocation from an ISP, I might wanna use uh, a unique local address block and do a network prefix translation um, in order to have to not have to renumber if I'm moving around. But in general, we don't we don't advise that an organization get a provider assigned address block. We advise that they get a provider independent address block. So this is going to be assigned by a regional internet registry, LACNIC, for instance, uh, RIPE in Europe, uh, Aaron in North America, etc. This is best for multi-home networks and it's portable. So I, once I get this allocation, it's mine to use forever. So that this means that I don't have to renumber. I mean, forever meaning that I pay my dues and, 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 uh, and behave on the internet. But this is generally a situation where I've got a multi-home network. Uh, here are my ISP allocations again. And in this case, I'm going ahead and getting a slash 36 from, um, from the, uh, the regional internet registry and that's mine to use going forward. So how big should an organizational IPv6 allocation be? Well, in general, we see most enterprises receive a slash 32 to a slash 44. That initial example where I showed the enterprise, the early enterprise adopter getting a slash 48, well, as, we, as we've seen, a slash 48, uh, it's, it, you can't be multi-homed with a slash 48, or you could be, but it's difficult to do. Um, it's generally non-portable because I'm getting it from, say, from an ISP. If I get it from a regional internet registry, I don't have room to grow because a slash 48, uh, typically it's advised that you assign a slash 48 to a site within your organization. So if my enterprise is larger than one site, if I get a slash 48, I already don't have enough IPv6 address space, which sounds ridiculous because as we've mentioned, slash 48, that's 1.2 times 10 to the 24th host addresses, more than enough to address your network. Um, but the point is that I'm going to be assigning a slash, at least a slash 48 to every site. So what constitutes a site in IPv6? Well, it's a logical construct. So it's whatever I decide to define a site as that makes operational sense for my particular network. And that can be based on network topology. It can, can be based on routing and security policy. It's based on whatever makes sense for my particular uh, organization and my particular network and whatever best operationalizes, uh, maximizes my operational efficiency. So sites are often assigned a slash 48. They can be assigned more than that. They typically are not assigned less than that. Now, if I'm a service provider and I have CPE devices, maybe I'm giving them a slash 56, um, but that's a little bit of a special use case. Uh, many service providers are moving towards providing a slash 48. Sites can get a smaller or a larger allocation depending on what makes operational sense for them. But again, address conservation, host address conservation, we don't care about that at this point. We're just thinking in terms of the consumption of overall IPv6 prefixes. And if I don't have enough slash 48s for my network, then I go back to the rear and I get a larger allocation. And the rears are holding 
uh, additional bits up to the nibble uh, in reserve for, for an organization that makes a request. So if I go to a rear and I request a slash 32, like say here in North America, requesting a slash 32 from Aaron, if Aaron assigns me a slash 32, they're actually holding a slash 28 in reserve. So that's 16 additional slash 32s that are available for my organization. So different rears will handle this differently, but there's almost always contiguous space being held in reserve so that if I need a larger allocation, I can go back to the rear and get it. So IPv6 site assignment. Here's some examples of, of a site. Uh, it could be a corporate headquarters campus. So I could have many buildings that each has its own network and maybe I assign a slash 48 to that. It could be a data center. Um, again, because a slash 48 is the smallest routable prefix, it's generally a good idea to hold that slash, you know, to, to think of that slash 48 as the smallest uh, prefix that I'm going to assign to a site. Maybe my data center is connected via, say, uh, um, MPLS, um, you know, layer three VPN over, you know, the internet today, and, and it's all going back to a location where there's an internet head end connection. But maybe tomorrow I want to connect my data center directly to the internet. If I have a prefix smaller than a slash 48, I can't do that without black holing some portion of that, that subnet. So I, as, a, as a precaution, as a way to future proof the network, uh, to always be uh, available to connect that particular site to the internet, I may want to use um, something that's not never smaller than a slash 48. A regional office might be a slash 48, uh, might be a, considered a site that we're going to assign a slash 48 to. A regional office might be only a single um, LAN. Uh, maybe there's only a handful of host addresses. Again, host address consumption is not the concern. So we don't really care if I've got, you know, 10 workers in a remote office, I should be entire, com perfectly comfortable assigning a slash 48 to that remote office, even though there's a very small consumption of IPv6 host addresses. A home network might get a slash uh, 48. We're seeing some of the service providers um, that are providing uh, um, fixed broadband moving towards providing larger allocations to uh, uh, CPE devices. If you've ever uh, turned up a, a tunnel to Hurricane Electric using their tunnel broker, um, they will assign you, they'll route to you once your tunnel is up and running to say your laptop, uh, they'll, they'll route you a slash 48. They'll assign uh, a slash 48 prefix, prefix to that tunnel and route an entire slash 48 just to your single endpoint on, on the IPv6 internet. And then uh, this is actually, this is actually true. Uh, in Germany, the, the uh, fire department there, the, I guess there's a national one, and they've, they've gone ahead and assigned slash 48s to all of their fire trucks. So this is obviously for, you know, sort of sensors and, and the things that they might be addressing on, on the fire truck that they use for uh, telemetry and that sort of thing. Uh, they're using a slash 48 for that. I don't think that's uh, actually what German fire trucks look like today, but that's a historical example of what, uh, what they might have looked like in the past. And, and for the record, I, I wish I owned one. Uh, looks like it might be fun to drive around town. So the second principle, now that we've, we've talked about having a large enough allocation, we need to do, make sure that we do our subnetting on nibble boundaries. So when I look at what that, what that means then, if I subnet on nibble boundaries, and this is showing prefixes from slash 32, from the slash 32 level down to the slash 48 level, the number of subnets that I have to play with um, per slash 32. If I subnet on uh, the slash 36 boundary, that gives me 16 subnets. If I subnet on the slash 40, that gives me 256 subnets. Slash 44 is 4,096 and a slash 48 is 65,000. So these four numbers here, 16, 256, 4096 and 65,000, those are critical to remember when you're doing your address plan because basically you have to decide if, if you have a certain number of sites or a certain number of entities that you want to set aside subnets for, uh, you have to think, is it smaller than 16? Is it larger than 16, but smaller than 256? Is it larger than 256, but smaller than 4,000? Is it larger than 4,000, but smaller than 65,000? That's going to sort of decide which of those nibbles that you're, you're picking to do your subnetting from. And the number of slash 48 subnets per group are shown there. So then you could apply a general rule of 75% consumption. As soon as I get to say 12 sites, then I would immediately need a slash 40 instead of a slash 44. If I have more than one site, I need at least a slash 44. If I have more than 12 sites using that 75% consumption rule, then I'm gonna need a slash 40. 
If I have more than 192 sites, then I'm going to need a slash 36. And if I have more than whatever that is, 3192, um, then I'm going to need a slash 32. And the same thing happens on within the site. If I, if I want to carve up that, that prefix within the site and say this might happen in a campus headquarters where I have, say, more than one network and I want to decide how I want to carve up that, uh, that slash 48 prefix, to assign subnets within that site, I, I'm going to use those same principles here. But these nibbles make IPv6 prefixes more legible. So <clears throat> as long as I stick to the nibble boundary, if I look at the network portion of the prefix, I always, or the prefix rather, um, and not the, the interface ID, I always know that that, I always know that that every character in the prefix maps to a particular location or a particular function. As soon as I move away from the subnets not being a multiple of four, then I have to expand out that, that prefix to know which half of the prefix I happen to be looking at. And so that's less operationally efficient because as we all know, you know, when DNS, for some reason, if DNS stops working, and that wouldn't happen if you're using InfoBlocks, but let's say you're using a bind white box servers or whatever, you have to do network troubleshooting based on the prefix, based on the IP address itself. I can look at a pre, as long as I stick to the nibble boundary, I can always look at a prefix and know exactly where that prefix is assigned because it's unambiguous um, based on the fact that every character in that prefix and especially the character just before um, the, uh, the interface ID is generally going to tell me where that's been assigned and I can, I can use that to improve my operational efficiency. And that, that's shown here. So I can map location or function into my IPv6 address prefixes. So let's say I pick, I pick on that first uh, nibble, and this is, this is in the slash 48 range. Of course, this would work from slash 32 to slash 44. I'd be looking at that, that third hex tet, but in this case, the fourth hex tet, I pick on that first nibble and I say, I'm gonna assign that to the location within my network, within my site rather. Um, and in this case, I've got 16 values that that character could be. I generally won't use zero and F, I'll just reserve those. So the first, because generally we don't, uh, there's a reason for this in that if I, if I use a zero subnet, um, I have to look at the CIDR notation to know whether I'm looking at the larger uh, or the smaller prefix because the, the prefix is exactly the same. If I start with one and, and go through, uh, go through um, E and not, I'm going to just leave F off, I'll just reserve that, then I always know that I'm looking at a particular location. So I might assign each of those slash 52s to a building uh, in, inside a corporate headquarters for a particular site. And then I'm gonna go ahead and leave uh, 4,000, that leaves me 4,096 interface subnets um, that I can assign to, uh, to individual interfaces. And of course I could continue to subnet, I don't need to go immediately to the interface level. Uh, I, could, I could have within each, within each location, say within each building, I might have floors and I might go from slash 52 to slash 56 and that would give me 16 subnets um, per floor that I could assign, or 16 subnets that I could assign to floors rather, then each of those 16 subnets would have 256 slash 64s each. But the nibble math always gives us 16, 256, 4096, or 65K. So then what that would look like building wise, um, a building gets a slash 52, and then each of those VLANs in the building would be assigned just slash 64. And again, I'm not using the zero subnet. Um, I go immediately to one, and then I start numbering up from there. And you can see the example going forward. So generally what happens with enterprises is, uh, when we apply these rules of a slash 64 per interface, a slash 48 per site, and we use nibble boundaries, uh, and PI space, uh, enterprises often discover that they didn't get a large enough allocation. They, maybe they only got a slash 40, 48 and they have more than one site, or maybe they only got a slash 44 and they have more than 12 or 16 sites. Uh, so generally they have to go back to the regional internet registry or back to the ISP in some limited cases, but generally they're not used to, to interfacing with regional internet registries as often as service providers are. So this is sort of a new, new territory for, uh, for enterprises. Um, of course, they've discovered that, you know, regional internet registries make it, they try to make it as easy as possible, um, especially with IPv6, uh, to, to do the, the uh, organizational, the, uh, uh, the bureaucratic requirements that, that they need to jump through, the hoops that they need to jump through in order to get the IPv6 address space 
and uh, REARS, regional internet registries are trying to make it easier than ever to get IPv6 address space to encourage uh, enterprises and service providers to adopt IPv6. So here's a, a, a very brief case study. This is based on inter, uh, inter, a couple of different enterprises that I've worked with here at Infoblox to show you an example of how they've thought about their own address plan. So in this case, this is a, a fictional company called Radia, and it's a business that's based in the US. It's manufacturing, Fortune 500 company, very large, 150 facilities on six continents, so it's multinational, uh, 65,000 employees, and, and a lot of revenue. A uh, very large network, as you might imagine, a headquarters campus in the U.S. with 18 data centers total worldwide, 60 manufacturing plants, 300 regional offices, and stitched together using MPLS WAN, um, regional internet re uh, connectivity. So then they went ahead, because they're operating multinationally, they went ahead and got slash, they got IPv6 allocations from every regional inter internet registry in which they're doing business. Now, you can use at this point in time, it, it's, it's considered acceptable to use out of region announcements for IPv6. So theoretically, I could get a single allocation from a rear in whatever region that I'm headquartered in. Say in this case, the company's uh, based in the US. Uh, it, could get a lar it could get a large allocation from Aaron and it could use that everywhere globally. Uh, but in this case, they went ahead and got an allocation from each of the rears in case for whatever reason, uh, down the road, the policy changes and, and out-of-region announcements aren't allowed. I don't think that's going to happen. No, uh, the, the folks that I've talked to in the, the regional internet registries and the service providers, they don't think this is going to happen. But it, you know, it just it's it, if it's my network, I want to make sure that I have an allocation ready to go in case for some reason uh, I have a, a service provider in say Asia where sometimes this issue comes up and they're like, I'm not going to accept your out-of-region announcement and maybe I have to number into an in-region announcement in order to continue uh, advertising that space. So IPv6 subnets, this is how they've broken it down. A regional block, a slash 32 for the entire region. Um, and obviously here we show the number of slash 48 networks with 65,000 slash 48 per slash 32. They've gone ahead and decided that they're going to make us, for their largest sites, they're gonna use a slash 40. So I, I mentioned earlier that a slash 48 was sort of the smallest site uh, allocation that we might use. In this case, with a large company, uh, they've chosen to use a slash 40 for their largest sites. Um, in general, they'll use a slash 48 for their smaller sites. And then 64 goes on a segment. In this case, they're using point to point link slash 127s because they're running older routing gear uh, that requires that they may run into that neighbor discovery cache exhaustion attack. Otherwise, they would be perfectly okay with using a slash 64 uh, on the point to point link. So site allocations look like this, regional slash 32, slash 40 for extra large sites, slash 48 for uh, regular size sites. And each one of those extra large sites, um, the slash 48 is gonna be assigned to different functions. And within the smaller sites, they go right to the VLAN level uh, within the site. So they're not doing any hierarchy within the sites. And then within uh, the same goes for each of the functions in the extra large sites, uh, they go to the VLAN level. So what that looks like in terms of their actual allocation, campus allocation here for their headquarters site, they get a slash 40, and then they've got they've actually got a manufacturing plant at lo, co-located at their headquarters site that gets a slash 44. They've got a number of data centers that is each going to get a slash 44. And if I go from the slash 40 to the slash 44 level, that gives me 16 slash 44s. So they could number up to 16 different uh, functions within that larger site, uh, each of those getting a slash 44. Then within data centers, say uh, the data, there's more than one data center in each location. And if they go from the slash 44 to the 48, then that gives them 16 slash 48s that they can use the number of their data centers into. So then a corpus camp, corporate campus site template, this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, standard slash 48 site, they get a, a 52, a slash 52 for each of the locations within that site. And they set aside a slash 52 um, then for functions, they go to the slash 56 level and then down to the VLAN level. So that gives you some idea of what that's going to look like. And then data center templates, slash 48, um, maybe they set aside a slash 60 uh, for application pods and tenants and each of those slash 60s. If I go from the slash 48 to the slash 60 level, I have 4,096 uh, application pods or tenants that I could support and each one of those pods or tenants would get 16 slash 64s to use. Um, so very simple plan, five rears with IPv6, 
three slash 32s, one slash 31, and one slash 29. Each region gets a slash 32. Extra large sites uh, containing a corporate campus, data center, manufacturing facilities get a slash 40. Standard sites get a slash 48. And then they use site templates to provide some hierarchy within those campuses, data centers, regional offices, et cetera. A slash 52 will be reserved at locations without a site template, and they'll just allocate slash 64s out of that. So hopefully this is encouraging. You, you should notice that it's pretty simple. If I stick to the nibble boundary, um, I've got some, some pretty uh, manageable subnets that, I, that I'm assigning uh, to particular functions or locations, and I can, I can put all that in a, just a single bullet point slide to sort of uh, relate that to, uh, to anyone outside of the networking team. The operations view of the network um, is really something that allows this to happen, and IPv6 supports that. So I'm able to define organizational entities, tie those to locations or roles, and then assign them an IPv6 prefix of the same, of the same size, and I'm off to the races. So whether or not to use a larger allocation for the largest of the network entity, entities, entities drove the need for the, large, the total larger allocation of a slash 32, and this is the opposite of subnetting smaller and smaller in order to provide enough prefixes uh, to be able to use for my network. So how might this change going forward? Well, in the cloud space, uh, say with AWS, with Amazon, we're seeing a slash 50, 56 being assigned for each EC2 VPC instance, not a slash 48 because uh, each of those EC2 VPC instances are in one availability zone. So uh, a slash 56, I mean, obviously that's more than enough for most EC2 VPC uh, deployments that anyone might consider or conceive of. Um, IoT deployments, what we're seeing, IPv6 standardization is finally arriving and that's gonna reduce the number of proprietary solutions. So we're likely to see a lot more IPv6 deployment into IoT spaces. Again, uh, I may be thinking in terms of if I have an IoT deployment of a particular collection of, uh, of sensors, uh, you know, I'm, I may wanna think about assigning a slash 48 to that rather than a slash 64, uh, just to give myself a consistently sized allocation, room for growth, and then potentially the ability to route it over the internet if I need to. Uh, containers are still largely relying on IPv4 and NAT at this point, but we've seen some progress in the IPv6 space. And then we might see a slash 64 being assigned per host going forward. Uh, so this would really drive up the, the level of, uh, of utilization and probably lead to more slash 48 assignments. And then, as I mentioned earlier, because of home net, because of the fact that we have so many devices coming online within the home and so many uh, networks getting uh, larger and more complex within home networks, uh, we may see slash 48s be the standard prefix assignment instead of slash 56s for service providers. So uh, I wrote a book on IPv6 address planning, as mentioned, um, if you want more, even more of the gory details than what we talked about today. And then Infoblox has a, an address planning tool that you can use uh, that shows a very sort of high level of how to carve up uh, a large allocation. Um, and there you can see an example of it there. So you, might, you may want to check that out along with uh, Infoblox's um, IPv6 Center of Excellence website that where we blog on IPv6 regularly and, uh, and have white papers and solution guides for IPv6 related topics. And that's all I had for today. Hopefully we've got a little bit of time for questions. I, I'm right up against the hour, but I'm happy to, uh, to stay a little bit longer if, uh, if we've got some questions that I can hopefully answer. So thanks again for everyone for attending today and, uh, and hopefully I can get your questions answered at this point. Hello, Tom. Alejandro here. Uh, well, Hi, Alejandro. First, first uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was terrific. I really, I, personally, I really enjoy it. And I hope the rest of the attendees also did. So far, uh, I only have one question for you. Okay. Uh, uh, the question comes from Ricardo Pelaz Negro. And his question is the following: What can be the well, uh, what can be the impact of change IPv6 classful design to classless, as is proposed by draft in ITF? The question is also in the chat box. Maybe you, you can check it. There are not too many mes messages in the chat box. Okay. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I, I think that, that, so. Just to sort sort of uh, provide more context around the question. So I think, and I haven't seen this particular IETF draft, but I think what, what they're suggesting is that, uh, that we move 
towards the IPv4 model of using individual bits for our subnetting, um, and that the recommendations around how to subnet a network uh, would be um, would allow for uh, assigning subnets based on using individual bits. And as I mentioned earlier, as soon as we move away from the nibble boundary in IPv6, uh, we create this ambiguity where I have to look at the expansion of the subnets to the right of the network prefix in order to understand which half of the prefix I'm looking at or which, which portion of the prefix that I'm looking at depending on where I'm doing the subnetting if I'm using individual bits. So I, I think it's perfectly fine. I mean, we should do, we've got the freedom to do what, whatever we need to do for our particular organization, our particular network, you know, whatever our network happens to look like, it might make sense for a particular network operator to not use nibble boundary subnetting, uh, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, the risk is that if you get into um, doing your IPv6 address plan and you don't know any better and you're used to using a classless allocation where you're using individual bits to carve up your subnet sizes, you're missing out on the opportunity to create uh, a tremendous amount of operational efficiency by having a consistently sized prefix on the nibble boundary assigned to each entity in your network. So if I'm using an IP address management tool like one that Infoblox offers, maybe I'm less concerned about, about that operational, that the, the sort of clarity that I get with the nibble boundary and the operational efficiency that that might give me because I'm getting my operational efficiency on the back end from having an IP address management tool. And maybe I don't want a one size fits all. Maybe part of my network, I wanna go ahead and use nibble boundary subnetting and another part of the network, like let's say when I get into the site and we'll see this with, uh, you know, like if I assign an entire slash 48 to a data center and I just start numbering slash 64s out of that monotonically, well, you know, that's, you know, that's, a, case, that's a case where I'm kind of using classless, uh, you know, individual bit assignment uh, of, of a prefix in order to get it on an, on an interface and, and to get it into production. And that's perfectly okay. So, you know, I don't wanna discourage anyone from doing anything that makes sense for their network. What I do wanna discourage is not understanding how nibble boundary, how the nibble boundary applies in IPv6 and how that creates the opportunity to have an address plan that will give you plenty of room to grow into and give you operational efficiency at the same time. So it's a great question. And, uh, and it's something that, uh, that I'll be tracking going forward. Um, the IETF has generally gotten a lot of things right with their recommendations around subnetting and IPv6. Um, but you know, there's always new proposals and, and those proposals are sometimes based on corner cases operationally that may or may not translate to the larger, uh, you know, the larger collection of service providers or enterprise, uh, provide, or enterprise deployers of IPv6. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, Ricardo, you are the guy who have to say if uh, Tom answered the question properly. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I will uh, skip to my question and then go, go back with another question that Ricardo has. And my question okay. for you, Tom, is regarding ULAs and glo global addresses. What do you think about the, the what should we use inside our network? So the question related to unique local addresses versus global unicast addresses. Um, the, the two different allocations in IPv6, unique local addresses are roughly the equivalent of, of private addressing in IPv4. And the idea is that uh, it, it really depends on why you're deploying ULAs as to whether or not to use them. If you're doing it simply because you've always used private addressing in your enterprise internally and you wanna do the same thing in IPv6, that suggests that you would be using NAT 6.6 at the edge of the network. And that's not a good reason to deploy unique local addresses um, because the presumption there is that there's, additional, there's an additional level of security that you're getting from that, that having that address topology obscured to the outside world. But security experts will tell you that that's not really secure. Um, if you're doing it because you have, if you're deploying ULAs internally because you want to have an internal network um, with services that are only available internally, I think that's a perfectly good use case. Additionally, if you're a small enough site where 
you want to be able to do network prefix translation and use ULA addresses internally so that you might switch providers on the outside and move to a new provider with a different global unicast prefix on the outside that maps to your unique local address prefix on the inside. Uh, that's a good use case as well. Um, again, ULAs are limited because I generally can't have contiguous uh, blocks larger than a slash 48. If I'm allocating the ULA prefix correctly, I have, an, I have a randomly generated um, prefix that I'm getting from uh, in the FD00 slash 7 range. Uh, I want to make sure that I, I do that correctly according to the rules. Um, but, you know, again, it, it depends on the use case. If it's a security use case and, and basically I'm thinking, well, you know, I just I, I don't want to have global unicast allocation addresses on the inside of my network because they're less secure, uh, then I would argue that your security policy and your security posture is probably not as mature as it needs to be. And that's not a good reason to deploy uh, unique local addresses. Um, hopefully that answers the question. And if there's a follow up, I'm happy to tackle that as well. Are we still there or did I did I lose you, Alejandro? Okay. Uh, Tom, um, one last question for you. Do you hear mm -hmm. me? Yes, I can hear you. Well, it's the, a question from Ricardo. Uh, he's asking, what do you think or suggest about addressing plans for governments? So for governments, um, one thing that I've run into here in the US, and it, it may be the same in other locations, oftentimes what happens with, with governments is that they get uh, a single large allocation. And in many cases, they've, they've tried to do the right thing and it's, it's very similar to what happens with enterprises. They tried to do the right thing by getting an allocation early. Uh, and, and in general, uh, we see that in some cases they got, uh, they got an allocation that was too small. And so then what happens is, uh, you know, you may have, a, you may have a, uh, an organization, you may have an office or an agency within the government that's responsible for handing out all of the IP space. And if they didn't get a large enough allocation, what happens is they start uh, handing out sm smaller allocations to their sub agencies or the agencies that are making the request. And so this, this is a really challenge. This can be really challenging because if you're obligated to get an, a prefix from that agency uh, and, and you realize doing your address plan that you need a larger allocation, uh, you may be uh, denied a larger allocation because the, the government agency responsible for handing out the addresses didn't get a big enough allocation and they may not understand uh, that they don't have a large enough allocation or that they potentially need a bigger one. So maybe there's a workaround and that you can go right to the regional internet registry and get an allocation directly from them, even if you're, even if you're a government office and maybe register that with the, uh, the, the agency. Uh, otherwise, you just have to put pressure on that agency to say, look, I just need more IPv6 address space. And if you need to get a larger allocation, then that's something that you need to take care of. Um, but but this is something that I've run into here in the U.S. Uh, and it and it may be a problem in in Latin American countries as well. Uh, it's something to be aware of. Otherwise, all of the same principles related to address planning should apply. Uh, government networks I don't think have uh, requirements that that fall outside of of the topics that I've, that I've covered here today. But if I haven't thought of something, please uh, please let me know and I'll try to get that answered. Uh, well, Tom, it, it looks that we have no more questions um, on the queue. So I have not much to say. I just, uh, before ending the, the webinar, I really want to say thank you uh, for being in this webinar with us. Uh, your explanation was terrific. I really enjoy it. Many times I do teach uh, and I do some, some sort of se uh, seminars regarding IPv6 address planning. So I believe that I will copy some of the, some of your ideas. Oh, please, uh, please do. <laughs> okay, I will. Okay, remember this webinar is, is being recorded. So now everybody can see it. Uh, well, well, 
Uh, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, also to the attendees, thank you for being with us. Please remember, in case you have any any topic that you would like us to to help uh, a webinar, uh, contact Janina or or to myself, and we will try to to find out who is the right guide for that for that topic. Uh, well, Tom, thank you some one more time for for your time and everybody for for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alejandro. Thank you. Take care. You do. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.